So, you want to install Linux, but you don't exactly want to take Windows out back like old Yeller and, well, do what you do to old Yeller. Instead, you want to keep your Windows, but you also want to try out Linux. Well, today, I'm going to show you how to do just that. We're going to be doing something called a dual boot. And it's thanks to one of you that we're doing this video today. So, let's get right into it after the pie does its thing on the screen and the text appears, you know, intro. Hello and welcome. My name is Wolfie and you are watching Greater Than Pie. So, dual booting, what is it? Is it safe? Well, yes, actually, dual booting is something that's been around with PCs probably as long as they've existed in some form of another. My oldest system in our current apartment is actually a Dell Optiplex that comes from 1996. It is old, it is decrepit, and it still has the functionality necessary to dual boot. And for the most part, almost all cases and pre-built computers have the ability to at least be modified to accept a dual boot system. But I guess we really should ask the question, what is dual booting and how does it work? Well, quite simply, dual booting just means that you have a second operating system that you can boot into on your computer. Now this is different than using a virtual machine where you can actually kind of pop in and out of it regularly. Instead, you actually have to turn your computer off and then reboot the computer into the new operating system. This though does have some serious advantages. It means that you're not gonna be dealing with as much latency, you will have better access to the hardware in general, and because of the nature of a dual boot, well, everything can be separated pretty nicely for you. Now, there are a couple of ways to do this though, and we're gonna be focusing on what I consider the best way with the best solution, but is also the easiest. You see, we could be talking about how to partition drives, and, or we can be talking about creating bootable USB drives that allow you to install Linux on them and then just power it off the drive. Instead, we're gonna be talking about a more permanent solution. And this is the way that I've personally found has the least number of issues and the best results. So, what is that method? Well, it is one drive, per operating system. Now, in a way, this does mean that there is some sort of a cost to doing it this way, but trust me when I say this, this is honestly the easiest and cleanest way to do this. Windows has a weird tendency of screwing with things that it shares a drive with. I have been warned by a couple people that it tends to try to overwrite data regularly, and it also has a tendency to expand out past its initial volume whenever it feels like it. And since it actually has control over partitions, it can lead to some serious screwiness on a drive that it shares with another partition that has a different operating system. Now, this is all allegedly, and I personally haven't tested it yet because, well, I'm pretty new to Linux, but this is coming from some people who have used it a lot longer than I have. So the cleanest way is to just make sure that the drive that you use for Linux is also separated from Windows. And I mean, it's pretty simple to do. Almost every single case, even the pre-built variants, have a second hard drive slot that is often unused. And this is because in most cases, they're using a standard that was created long ago where two hard drives for dual booting was quite regular. In fact, you don't even have to install Linux on the second boot if you really wanted to. Windows 11's around the corner, you can install Windows 11 on a different hard drive and boot into it, and if you find that you don't like it, you can just go back to Windows 10 on your original drive. That's part of the purpose of it. It's for software and hardware development. But in this case, we're doing Linux, which is honestly easier to install than even some Windows operating systems. Before you jump in and start installing Pop or Ubuntu or any other Linux distro of that matter, you're gonna wanna do just a little bit of research to make your life a little bit easier. Looking at this hard drive, I don't think you'd be able to tell me what its name in your BIOS actually is. And that is because your BIOS does not use the same name that Windows does. That's actually a feature of Windows that allows you to name and map drives. 
But unfortunately, your BIOS doesn't see that name. It's not written to the drive anywhere. It's just in Windows. No, you need to know your drive's actual name. I will tell you, this is slightly annoying. This is one of those things that if you don't feel comfortable doing, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I will tell you that this drive is, and allow me to read this out, ST3750528AS. Am I ever gonna remember that? No, but I will tell you how to read this and sort of remember. ST is gonna be in front of any drive from Seagate and SD will be in front of any of the ones from SanDisk, and WD is in front of any of the ones from Western Digital. Samsung will have some sort of a variant that has the S in front of it as well. I think it's like SA actually is Samsung. Don't hold me to that because I haven't really seen too many of those drives, but I do know that it's something like that. There's always a two letter identifier in front of each drive. And if your system is built custom like mine, most likely your drives aren't all the same. I personally run a Western Digital and a SanDisk drive in my system that are both SSDs. And those are the two that I've picked to be my two operating system drives because well, they're solid state. And more importantly, I can identify which is which fairly easily. In a case where you have more complicated numbering or maybe even the same drives like if you've got like two western digital ssds that you want to boot off of how would you tell well it's always going to be on the drive itself there's going to be a serial number and then there's going to be a name and that name is actually the one that you want to pay attention to sometimes the serial number is reported but almost always it's going to report the name itself in the bios but if you're still unsure if you are still uncomfortable with the prospect of adding a new operating system and are afraid of overriding your old one, remove your Windows drive. Plain and simple. You can put it back in anytime later. But if you are uncomfortable and don't think that you are going to be able to install on the right drive, just unplug the SATA from it and you will be good. It cannot access it without the SATA plug plugged in. You don't even have to take it out of the system. Just unplug it SATA port and then plug in the drive that you want to be your Linux drive separately. Now from there, we've got our drive. We know what it's called or we've set it up so that it's the only drive in the system. Installing Linux from there is actually super, super simple. You plug in the USB, you pop in your BIOS, and you should have something called a boot override or a boot loader. My motherboard has both, and I can choose to boot the USB one time or boot the USB first all the time. It's all up to you. It looks different across various BIOS. Sometimes it's depicted as a bunch of drives up on a line. Those are the MSI ones. Uh, for the Asus one, you have to go into boot and it looks a lot more complicated, but going through these menus slowly is the key. Just specifically look for boot. You'll see usually two options, either boot override or boot order. You wanna make sure that when you're installing an operating system that the first one is USB. You either can override it to USB or you can set it to USB. And that is the easiest way to make sure that your BIOS will grab the USB device and start trying to install the operating system. After that, it's pretty straightforward. The operating system install will guide you through everything. You're gonna select the drive that you picked. So in this case, if we were installing it on here, we would pick ST3750528AS. <laughs> uh, rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> in this example, we would install on this drive, we would select this drive, and it will do what it needs to do to install the operating system. It might reboot, it's gonna do its thing. From here then comes, well, the fun part. You see, now you've got Windows, you've got Linux. You can't run them at the same time though. And this is actually one of the key things about dual booting is they're isolated from each other which is kind of important. Windows won't touch the drive and Linux won't touch Windows. They're separated and it just makes sense to do it this way. But when it comes down to it from here, you're gonna have to have a little bit of BIOS know-how. So remember how I showed you how to select your USB device as your primary boot? Well, most BIOS use UEFI and it kind of makes it so that the BIOS is a bit smart. Now, this isn't a bad thing at all, actually. In fact, in many cases, I actually prefer this, but your BIOS might try to go back to Windows, even if you 
just installed Linux. It might try to go to the Windows drive first. And that is because, well, in many cases, your BIOS is set up to defaultly target Windows. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, in fact, in my particular BIOS, it will boot to whatever drive was successfully booted. So if I boot to Linux, it will boot to Linux. If I boot to Windows, it will boot to Windows on every power cycle, which means I don't have to switch back and forth, which ends up being convenient. But if you do need a switch, it's not too hard. BIOS exactly where we selected the USB, we can actually make it so that it prioritizes one boot over the other. In my personal case, I do boot into Windows 99% of the time. But while I'm playing around with Linux, I can just as easily go in there and actually use the boot override to boot directly into Linux. When I'm in Linux, I can easily select Linux from just the BIOS. And you should know how to get to your BIOS. In most cases, it's mashing delete. And sometimes it's like F something. Usually your, your computer will tell you what it is. Now, there are some motherboards that will actually allow you to select instead of immediately booting, going to a boot selector. Now, this is a feature that's actually more common in office computers. In fact, I've actually worked with office computers that have encryption to the point that you have to put in a password before you can even boot into Windows and then it still tells you to do all sorts of crazy stuff. In this case, we're just doing this the easy way. Now you've got a dual boot. You're, you're good to go. Everything's all set up. Now, there are some things to address. Can you have a shared drive between Linux and Windows? Yes, as long as the operating systems are not on the same drive, you can actually map out drives that just have data on them pretty easily. It's not a problem. That being said, if Windows puts anything Windows related on that drive, it's gonna lock it down and it's sort of annoying, but it is a thing that Windows does. Is it dangerous to dual boots? Can it void your warranty? No. It's a feature. It's been in existence quite literally forever. It's perfectly safe. If you install your operating system correctly, you're good to go. What are the dangers of doing this? You might erase your Windows drive, which could have data on it if you don't take the steps that I talked about, about identifying your drives first. Always do this step before installing a new operating system. And I made sure to lay it out for you guys if you are uncomfortable or unsure exactly how to avoid doing it. Also to test if you've removed the correct drive, try booting your PC. If it says there's no bootable media device in there, it's, it's good, all right? Other than that, everything else is pretty safe, pretty straightforward. But at a later date, we're gonna be talking about gaming performance, compatibility, and actually making Linux your own. Because believe it or not, it gets kind of crazy. And thanks to some of you guys in the comments, I have definitely learned a lot. That is where we're going to end today. So thank you so much for watching. Consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and honestly, I can't wait to see you in the next video. Wolfie, out.